Thank you all for joining us tonight. Uh, as Bonnie uh, said, uh, this is a conversation about uh, technology, uh, art, law. I am not giving an art lecture. I am not competent to give an art lecture, uh, but I'm happy to talk about how art is one of the areas that is being heavily uh, disintermediated by technology and how that's reshaping what art is available for us and how it's affecting who we are. Um, so this is our talk uh, this evening, um, and that is a little preview that if I get to the end of the talk, I'll have a few minutes to talk about Banksy um, and some of the interesting technologies that want to embed in a art frame. Um, so I have to start, as I said, with uh, the disclaimer. Uh, the disclaimer uh, comes actually from 1903, no one less than uh, Justice Holmes, uh, writing in a case where he says, it would be a dangerous undertaking for persons trained only in the law to constitute themselves final judges of the worst of pictorial illustrations outside the narrowest and most obvious limits. Right? So our Supreme Court has recognized that we lawyers should not be art critics, and I will try to avoid being an art critic uh, tonight. So why am I here? So as Bonnie mentioned, I look at industries that are involved with intellectual property rights, uh, particularly patent and copyright. And I also obviously look at legal education, legal services, higher education, journalism, and entertainment media. All of these are disrupted industries. All of these have had technology really force the industry as a whole to rethink how it operates. And that's really what my focus is going to be. Very few people have talked about how the art world is being reshaped by technology, law, and other influences. And I think it's worth looking at the different technologies, how they're expanding to create new forms of art, how media markets are being uh, dis disrupted as a result, how it's changing the nature of the gatekeepers that identify what art has value and where art does not have value, and then where that might lead. And there are some positives, uh, more democratic access to art, we've seen this movement over the past 150 years, but also this concept of hyper-democracy, which I'll spend a couple minutes talking about, because I think this actually matters. I, I stand, very firmly believe that our artists are, in fact, very important social commentators. And as I've struggled over the years to understand what art is, I've come to my own personal belief that art really is a mechanism for intele public intellectuals to comment and critique the society around them. And so if we're undermining that process, then we lose something important in society. And we need to at least be aware that that process is changing. So what do I mean by disintermediation? I expect that you all recognize some of these images. You may have owned Microsoft Encarta uh, back in the mid-90s, which itself destroyed the Encyclopedia Britannica as physical books that we once had, or the shelves of world book that every uh, middle-class family had to collect to prove they believed deeply in their children. Um, Blockbuster, obviously, uh, Wayne Heisinga is a close friend of NSU, was very important to our history. Uh, there's one Blockbuster store left in North America. Uh, Sears is on the verge of closing. Polaroid, Kodak are companies that, all the brands are still around, the technologies that made those companies, and quite frankly, all innovation is not from those companies. They're really nothing more than labels. So those are examples of disintermediation taking place, but what does it mean? Disintermediation, or a truly disruptive market, is one where the existing model of the business unravels when a competing market or service transitions from one business model substantially to an entirely different business model. So to put that into context, we saw how Microsoft first took away the business of print encyclopedias, which itself was then disintermediated when Wikipedia came and turned that from a commercial product into a free service. And so in each phase of that disintermediation, 
the very structure of the economics of the industry utterly disappeared. Another example, perhaps not quite as disruptive, is actually the Swiffer mop. Right? So we think of this when the idea came for the Swiffer mop, the industry said this is a less effective mop than is the normal squeeze mop that's on the market. But what the company recognized was there is a huge, huge population that will never actually squeeze them off. And so if they can simply stick on a pad and wipe the floor, it's an entirely different marketplace. And that product has become so successful, it has, well, not eliminating squeeze mops, nearly put them out of, out of business because everyone uses some kind of disposable product today. Uh, same thing was true historically of our mousetrap. We often talk about building the better mousetrap. The better mousetrap of that story was actually a very sophisticated, very complex mousetrap, and no one would use it. And a company came around and built a really cheap mousetrap, but it had one advantage that the extensive, high-quality mousetrap that it had, it was disposable. And since no one wanted to peel the mouse out of the mousetrap, the cheap disposable mousetrap revolutionized the industry, the marketplace. And that's what we're seeing with technologies in education, newspapers, TV, and all sorts of other physical areas. So that's starting to happen to art as well, as I'll talk about here. The other philosopher that I spend a lot of time on um, at home um, is Marshall McLuhan. Uh, Marshall McLuhan, you may recall, uh, coined the phrase, the medium is the message. And that phrase is critically important for understanding some of the conceptual ideas that I'm going to talk about tonight. Because McLuhan's studies focus on the idea that both physically and psychologically, the actual hardware of our brain, neuropsychologically, the nature of how we absorb information changes how we process that information. So we talked a lot about the oral history of society transforming with the Hoover press, and how once we moved to a print society, it changed the way our brains worked. And we've seen physical changes to humanity as we moved from an entirely oral society to a print society. He was writing in the 60s with the advent of television and the electronic age. But most of what he's talking about with the original advent of television 60s is equally true and very prescient for the social media networked many-to-many -many world that we live in today. So again, we have to think about how art, by changing its medium, is changing the underlying message itself. And so these are the four areas that I'm going to try and cover tonight. Uh, chances are I will get to all four. I have far more slides than I have time for. Uh, but really looking just briefly at how art criticism has been affected by this intermediation. I'll spend a little bit more time on how art museums, um, as institutions that moderate access to art, are changing by technology. Of course, I can't skip the copyright and contractual side of legal enforcement, since that is my day job. Talk a little bit about markets, and also really focus on how the popular press and popular media um, which is often forgotten as a mediator of access to art and cultural artifacts, is actually a very important piece of this entire uh, process. As I mentioned to Bonnie, I always start here. Uh, for me, as a, as a copyright scholar, uh, Duchamp's uh, urinal is probably the most important piece of artwork of the 20th century. Of course, art critics agree for different reasons. Um, but it was a seminal piece of art when you look at art as a societal process. Uh, I'm sure many of you are familiar uh, with this piece, which really kind of presaged the entire postmodernist movement. Uh, for those who are not familiar with the story, uh, back in uh, 1917, uh, Duchamp entered this into what was supposed to be an unjury art exhibit. According to the rules of the New York Art Exhibit, any piece for which the artist paid the entrance fee was supposed to be allowed to be in the show. He had this piece placed in the show, and, uh, and he was on the board of directors of the art uh, exhibit itself. And his friends and colleagues spoke amongst themselves and decided that this 
ready-made the sound object. In fact, could not be put into the show. It was removed, and as a result of that, he quit uh, the organization. And it sent a lightning rod through all of the art world, which continued to grow as postmodernism uh, expanded, because it really questions the issue of what constitutes art. And the work has, over time, really been recognized as challenging our notions of art as a technical craft versus a social commentary. Now, Bonnie alluded to the question about the relationship between copyright and art, and so this is a perfect opportunity, using this piece as a class, uh, to remind us that it's a Venn diagram. There are some pieces of art that are protected by copyright, there are many pieces of copyrighted work that aren't art, and then in the middle there's works that are both copyrighted and art. This is a urine. When attached to plumbing, it still is a useful object. And as a useful object, it is not protectable by copyright. So the notion that it is art, which I absolutely believe it is, is separate from whether or not the copyright law will recognize it as a copyrightable work. And that tension exists between law and art quite a bit. And I'll show you a couple more examples of it. On the other hand, moving to a slightly later piece in uh, 1913, uh, this piece, because it's the juxtaposition of the stool and the bicycle wheel, uh, that is enough creativity. Although the two objects themselves are each a useful object found, uh, they are not, when put together in this particular way, a useful object, and therefore they are protectable. It is protectable as a work of copyright. And so we do have the difference between the two worlds. Just continuing to look at some seminal pieces in the development of art, as we go through the postmodern era, two pieces that are incredibly iconic for us. We have Jasper John's flag from 1954, 1955. We have the Andy Warhol diptych uh, of Marilyn Monroe. Right? The, the flag is a very uh, careful rendering of an actual flag. But if you look at it closely, you'll see it's made with caustic wax in a very interesting dynamic setting, which tells a lot about its story. The diptych references iconic uh, Christian uh, historical artwork. It brings a lot to the conversation about art. Also takes a lot of conversation about postmodernists and the abstract expression, saying abstract expressionist isn't enough, and we want to have some pop imagery, not just abstract, to further this conversation. Very important uh, intellectual discourse going on within the postmodern community about these pieces. And the reason that I bring these up in this context, and we continue to look at you know, Frank Stella, who has been exhibited here in the museum, Jackson Pollock, a great example of the pure abstract expressionist. These were the tensions that were going on among the art critics about what the art was um, looking like, how this discussion with really critical individual uh, commentators, curators, who were focusing on these particular pieces, looking at their relationship to the pieces that went before them, how they informed what went on after them. And there was a very concentrated number of collectors of art critics and art museums that were fostering this discourse. It was a closed community, in other words. And that closed community was driven by my fifth prong, by pop culture. There was a tremendous incentive on the part of pop culture, um, for reasons I'll describe in a second, to aggressively push the American postmodern abstract expressionist artwork. And we see examples here from the Dinah Shore show, from TV Guide, from other works that highlighted a very strong postmodernist ethos. Uh, Twilight Zone, if you think about that TV show, which has just recently been concluded, actually is a very, very postmodern existential series of storytelling. Fell into a particular milieu because of that. 
And the reason was that there was a very intentional goal with these postmodernist works, and it was really led by William S. Paley, but he was not alone. So in a talk I gave here a couple of years ago, um, I talked about this at great length, I'm only going to touch on it briefly today, but Paley, who grew out of the uh, U.S. military intelligence in the late 40s during World War II, understood the importance of the U.S. victory of the Cold War, the cultural Cold War that was developing. And in the Marxist and communist regimes around the globe, the real focus of art was realism, hyper realism, very strong, extremely realistic depictions of the plight of the working class, the plight of the dominated individual. We see those works throughout the Soviet Union, throughout Latin America, and it became the agenda of the Eisenhower administration, continued into subsequent administrations, Kennedy, Johnson, Nixon, that the U.S. art form had to invalidate that realism with as extreme another example as physically possible. And there's nothing more extreme from realism than this kind of abstract expression. And so millions of dollars were funded in cultural activities by the U.S. State Department, and Haley, as chairman of CBS, prominently displayed these works. He was also on the board of trustees of MoMA, and they funded millions of dollars into uh, you know, Rockefeller's Museum to build up this collection ethos, because it was part of a cultural agenda to have the U.S. cultural art form dominate the world. When you have that kind of agenda, and I know it sounds a little paranoid, perhaps, um, but in fact, there's an entire book written on it, I've written articles, and if you go to the CIA website, they admit it. Right? So this is history. Um, but the ability to fund art as a cultural artifact to control the agenda between the East and the West is a very, very powerful agenda for art to take on. And in fact, we see today that coming out of Asia, there are many, many touring exhibits that have exactly the same intent. There is the exact same goal to develop an agenda to expose other people to our culture, but more than that, to create a cultural dominance of the works that are traveling. And it's true in visual arts, it's true in music. A lot of money goes into music touring um, at the national and global level, and to other art forms as well. The flip side is there are many countries outside the United States that, particularly in the areas of television and film, heavily restrict U.S. works and other foreign works from their markets to create a cultural control over what their citizens see. And so there's a constant battle over trying to export culture, trying to maintain culture. And that kind of brings us to the change. Right, so we see in this slide the idea that really what we're looking at today with all of media, television certainly, radio to the extent that it exists anymore, newspapers, magazines, every form of communication is being changed radically in the way we have access to it. So I, again, a wonderful quote uh, from Learned Hand, uh, the hand that rules the press, the radio, the screen, and the far spread magazine rules the country. And one only need to look at one's phone to realize that the hand that controls Google and Facebook today rules the country. We have seen a massive rapid transformation in the way content is distributed, content is controlled, and all the old gatekeepers are falling away. When I talk with my students in an entertainment course, I would spend a lot of time talking about the role of the Federal Communications Commission, the 1934 Communications Act, talking about the role of the government in being able to control what's on the airwaves. Well, when I taught that class this semester, my students stared fairly blankly at me. And then I realized they didn't know what the term airwaves meant. 
It was a foreign concept to them. They've never seen a television dial. They have no idea what an antenna is. And every physical manifestation that gave rise to this regulatory system no longer exists. And so it's really a profound change that has crept up on us in just the last few years. I'm not sure if you can easily see uh, this particular slide, uh, but it gives you a sense of where people get their television content today. This is today. This is, all, this is not over the next 10 years we're going to see a new transformation of where we are. And this is on television. This is not overall. Overall, 40% of people get their content from Netflix today. Cable, basic cable, is 12%. Premium cable, 3.5%. What you broadcast is down to 7.5% of the public. So the very notion of the systems that we have regulating content are essentially irrelevant. Now, if you look at all screens rather than just television, what changes dramatically is YouTube, because YouTube comes up to 31%. So if you add your phone, your tablet, your computer screen, then the public is basically getting sources from either Netflix or YouTube or everything else combined, which is not a great story for Amazon, not a great story for Apple, um, but incredibly powerful dominance for those two sources of content. Now, Apple is trying to get back into the game. Um, and so just last week, Apple introduced a new, two many new services. Um, the, the service most relevant for this conversation is its new Apple Plus service uh, for $9.99 a month. Apple will allow you to, to sort through and kind of cherry pick through literally thousands of, new, of magazines. And so all of the magazine publishers have been asked to get on board, and they will earn pennies for people reading their articles. All of them will be distributed on an app controlled by Apple. Apple will make probably 30% of the revenue from it, and the other 70% of the revenue will be split among the three to 8,000 magazines that are published on the site. Publishers are struggling to decide whether this is their last final act before they go to business, because the pennies that will flow through are not enough to keep them in business, or if by not being in the bandwagon, that will hasten their demise faster. Companies like the New York Times says, no, we have a loyal following, our readership is actually increasing, and so there are newspapers who are fighting this trend. I'm sure you've seen as you go online, an increase in the number of times you're asked either to turn off your ad blocker so that the ads will provide revenue or to read a very few number of articles from a particular site before the site shuts you off and lets you subscribe. Right? Newspapers, magazines are trying to find a way to remonetize. Magazines, as we read from Learned at Hand, were an incredibly important part of U.S. culture. Magazines, unlike newspapers, provided the art criticism. They provided the long-form stories of the New Yorker and the New York Magazine, art critic magazine, and the like, that really had the time and luxury to provide cultural context. Apple may be its savior, or more likely, it will be the final act of the vast majority of its content which means we've lost that important voice in how we decide what is important and what isn't important in art. Newspapers, we continue to see the decline. Right? We know that newspapers are increasingly uh, difficult to find. Very few of them are in print anymore. So we've gone from every town having two or three newspapers to having a few national newspapers. But it's here you, you see the important numbers. Right, 10,000 fewer employees uh, since 1978. So as the world has increased in population, almost double the number of employees in newspapers has gone down by a quarter. Uh, and you can see the readership in the slide 
declining so precipitously. So one of the critics, um, close hand Derek Chan, um, who wrote this just after getting out of an Iranian prison, where he spent six years for uh, writing on the media and the government, made the comment that social media, by using algorithms to encourage comfort and complacence, since its entire business model is built upon maximizing the time users spend on it, the outcome is a proliferation of emotion, a radicalization of emotions, and a fragmentation of society. So as we switch from thoughtful intellectual discourse in traditional magazines to the clickbait of social media, what we find is increasingly the stories are designed to drive our emotions. And we know that effect, right? Anyone who's ever been online knows that it's designed to either make us right, pull out our heartstrings with heart-wrenching stories, or more likely to enrage us with extreme outrageous suggestions that they, whoever they might be, um, are accused of doing. And those stories proliferate, and they in fact have reinformed our nation's newspapers. And so the newspapers of today are printing stories that editors would never have let be in print five, ten years ago. Uh, because again, they don't have facts. They have emotions at their center. Because that's what social media feeds us over and over again. And it's also created a deeply fragmented society. So if art is a critical medium that's designed to bring us together, if you think about the millions of people who have gone to the Louvre and in the Louvre have gone to see the Mona Lisa, well, there is no Mona Lisa moment for us on social media. Even if something has 20 million hits, it is incredibly effective. It comes, it goes, it has no lasting impact. It may not last a week, let alone 200 or 300 years. So the results of these changes of technology have vastly changed the way that we consume information, the way that we as a society and as a globe are educated, the way we think about our world. And again, I start with the proposition that our artists are public intellectuals and social commentators. Well, is there public intellectualism left? Is there a social commentary that we can rely upon? So, minutes spent per day you can see that uh, the internet has now topped television for where the number of minutes are spent. Eat more alarming, right? Okay, fine, so the internet has overtaken television. Television was once described as the great wasteland, so it's not that we're losing a whole lot necessarily. But television hasn't gone down that much. It's that we've doubled the amount of time we're in front of technologically mediated content which part of that is we're in front of two screens, three screens, all that tasking, squeezing time into everything else we're doing. But it also means a society, and as a globe, we are not doing other things. We are not walking in our country. We are not walking apart because we're looking at our But there are influencers. Just as we have art critics, just as we have great museums, just as we have important newspaper critics of the past, we have the influencers of the internet age. So here's a picture from Forbes of this year's top influencers. These are the children that are setting the agenda for America today. And I encourage you to read the article. And Forbes struggled when it wrote the article because, in fact, it discounted in identifying its 30 influencers that it wanted to highlight. It disqualified much more popular influencers because Forbes found them so objectionable that it didn't want to identify them. That they were mere, that they, I should say heroes, but they were athletes, actors, people who wandered into the public sphere selling wares and are much more popular than the actual influencers who are, of course, themselves self-appointed, uh, usually people of my children's age, um, who are really good at recreating the movie. This is the cultural mediation today. Now, admittedly, very cranky faculty members in their 70s might not have been good at it either. Right? As a faculty member, I'm never sure about what some of our colleagues are about to say in any given day. 
But nonetheless, those individuals have spent a lifetime studying their area, their field, their expertise. They have been peer reviewed. They have been in constant discourse about their work. And cranky or not, they have risen in the ranks to have something to say. Rising in social media value doesn't have the same vetting process. We have moments in time. And you may recognize this image or one like it. It was from the images of 2011 regarding Arab Spring. And this is the ultimate risk of social media gone wrong. So in 2011, before the public really understood the risks of the internet, people got very excited as democracy was coming to an autocratic, sometimes theological autocracies uh, throughout the Middle East and throughout Asia. Well, in uh, far, eight, far East Asia, those processes were shut down very quickly, very efficiently, and nothing ever came to it. In the Middle East, instead, we had mobs demanding change on the street, and we had Western governments embracing this new outcry. And it was exciting because the idea that a people could free itself of tyranny is something that we in the West should desire, something that we want to see happen. The problem, unfortunately, was it's not enough for the mob to rise up. Democracy isn't what the United States exports. The United States actually exports the rule of law. It actually exports civil liberties. Democracy without civil liberties, civil rights, and the rule of law is not rule. And what we saw in Egypt and Libya and many of the other countries in the Middle East was this turned into mob rule. And either the totalitarian regime shut it down and retained power, we entered a civil war as we have in Syria, or a new autocracy took over. So Egypt, of course, is the prime example where a uh, theocratic dictatorship took over and the military decided, well, as between a theocratic dictator and a secular dictator, we get along with the secular dictator better, and in fact the rest kind of likes the secular dictators better, and so they overthrew the overthrowers and reestablished normalized relations with the rest. That is not a success story. That is hyper-democracy. One, one person, one vote is great because we're voting for a representative who can take the time and effort to be thoughtful. And you have to think of the political process. Those people are intentional and thoughtful about what they're doing when they're elected the representative. Even in our daily lives, we use insurance brokers and real estate brokers and many other agents to make sure that we don't have the time to learn something. We're relying on someone who has the time and expertise to do it right. In a hyper-democracy situation, there is no time, no thoughtfulness, just a quick reaction. And so this is one of the many reasons that we haven't seen a movement to say, let's turn the election system into an online uh, Twitter account. The technology exists. We could vote by uh, electronic ballot or electronic tweet. But in fact, what that would do is further erode our civil society. So, as I switch gears a little bit, looking at how this impacts art, and I found this is an interesting metaphor, I'm not going to belabor it much, um, but this is hundreds of pictures of Sunday in the Park of Four. How many are familiar with the musical? All right, so the majority of you have seen the musical. The reason I post this is because, interestingly, Every single picture I could find, when I searched through thousands and thousands of pictures, every single one of those pictures showed Surratt's images from Act 1. I could find but a single picture from Act 2 among the thousands I searched that showed the postmodern piece of the second act. And even there, it is juxtaposed with the Surratt image, it's not all. And that struck me that in the hyper-democracy age that we have right now, what you see happening with art, however you find that, and I'm not here to try and do so, but we're hearkening back 
we are looking at the postmodernists, the modernists, the impressionists, and the earlier ages, and we're kind of saying art ended as a matter of public discourse sometime in the 1950s and 1960s. And that, again, troubles me, because we've disintermediated that word again. We've disintermediated the flags and the cues that create a modern culture all around particular works of art. And that's what's missing today. So if it's not popular media, and it's not the press, where can we turn to find the solution for this problem? Well, how about here? How about our art museums? So this is a wonderful art museum. Um, I will at this point remind you that I'm an employee of Southeastern University. But it is, in fact, a wonderful art museum that has amazing collections, and Bonnie has created just a powerhouse of a collection here. Um, but it's not a very typical museum. Museums of this size are struggling desperately because they're both too big and too small. They're not community centers where we do arts and crafts and we can get along with a little money. This museum has amazing collections of very important artists. Frank Stella was here, Richard Prince is coming in the fall. Um, we have had astonishingly high quality works uh, exhibited here. But these size museums are going away. Instead, we have museums like this. Now, this is an amazing museum. It is the Museum in Bilbao, Spain, and it is an astonishing, astonishing uh, institution, and in fact has transformed the economy of the region. It is a major tourist destination. And as the museums like the MoMA's go global, and become tourist destinations, they become more and more like Disneyland than everything they do. So the shows have to be bigger than ever before. The costs are larger than ever before. The door prices go up, and it's all about the merchandise and the major donors. In 2013, there was a meeting of some of the seminal art directors, art museum art directors in the country. And in a piece written by Michael Govan, who was the director of Latin, the Los Angeles County Museum of Art, uh, as part of a white paper among his stellar collection of top art uh, gallery curators in the country, he wrote, and let me read you just a couple of things, the traditional functions of art museums, to collect, preserve, interpret, and present works of art, and to inspire and educate the public. Those are constantly in flux. The continued popularity of art museums, as well as the massive growth of their size and number, particularly over the last few decades, has not been accompanied by commensurate growth in sources of funding. Corporate sponsorships that fuel the growth of art museums have been significantly. Government support has been static or less, and individual philanthropy, which has risen to fill the gap, has often come with specific requirements from individuals who are not always supportive of holistic and public primary institutional mission. So what does that mean? Art museums are becoming bigger and bigger and more difficult to run. They are losing that first function, collect, preserve, interpret, and present, and becoming increasingly either the playgrounds of their donors or community centers that allow shows to come and go without having the financial wherewithal to collect, preserve, and present. And so museums, according to the best museum curators in the country, are facing almost an existential crisis about their historical role. Now again, we've always, so we've always struggled with our museums. So this is the Ashton Museum um, in England, this is a, a, a drawing from it from the 1920s. It's not what we necessarily would think of as a great art museum today, um, because early on in its history, collecting the cultural artifacts around the globe meant a lot of stuff and exotic animals, because people could travel much and know these animals actually existed. Right? So we always had these kind of issues. We also, of course, have all sorts of issues as to who particular museums represent. This museum did not open to female patrons until 1920, 
And so the students of Oxford and Cambridge were not allowed in. Uh, only male students were allowed in. We have museum issues today across the country, who they cater to, how do we curate the stories in a way that's meaningful to a much more open and varied public than it was 20, 30, 40 years ago. But again, my point is simply that museums, as the centerpiece of our cultural control, are losing their leadership. And if this doesn't bother you, or this doesn't bother you, then perhaps this will bother you. Because this is how we experience art today. Today we experience art through our camera. It's not about what we have done in the museum, it's not about the experience that we've had, it's whether we can put it on our Instagram account or not. And so this is, again, the modern museum of today. And yes, there were lines around the Mona Lisa for years, and in fact, there were people taking pictures of the empty space where the Mona Lisa hung. Uh, it was such a, a cultural icon. And people were taking pictures of the empty space. Uh, but the notion that the purpose of going to an art museum is a backdrop for one's own interaction with one's social media necessarily changes the experience of the art gallery. Now, I have officially only 10 minutes left, so I am going to tell you that the law matters, but not a whole lot, so I'm starting to skip very rapidly. Um, this is just very quickly, this is an example of a very impressive design for a work that ultimately did not receive copyright protection um, because it was a Mac Cat. Although it's that large, there's the artist working on her Mac Cat. It was not considered a work of visual art because it was destined to eventually be uh, made into bronze. And since it was never cast, the underlying component parts that were designed to be used for it were excluded from the additional protections that copyright works of visual arts afford. Jeff Koons, I cannot be here without saying something about Jeff Koons. He do something snarky. Um, and so here, one of my Jeff Koons, an appropriation artist, as Bonnie said, she and I disagree vividly about the role of appropriation art. Um, but the irony for me here is Jeff Koons sued the company that made these bookmarks, uh, these uh, bookends, saying that they ripped off his balloon dog. So first of all, it's just ironic that any appropriation artist would ever sue somebody else for appropriating their work. But the court dismissed the case, saying balloon dogs are in the public domain, and you don't own a copyright just because your balloon dog is big. And so in fact, Jeff Williams, as he often does, lost another lawsuit. A fascinating moment. So now I'm switching into where technology is bringing us. And again, I'm going to start talking really fast. Um, this is the lightning round. So one question about copyright is whether or not a work can be protected by copyright if there is no human living artist. So these are artworks created entirely by artificial intelligence. And AI can create very fascinating works of art today. They clearly are artwork. They are not copyrightable because there is no human. And the law is pretty clear that we want humans to create copyrighted work. Again, more work um, that was created entirely by AI. I love this page. This are artwork, and I think you'll agree with me, that is a fantastic photograph. So that fantastic photograph is in fact a self-portrait. And the act took the picture itself, not protectable by copyright because it's not a human. The elephant at the Cincinnati Zoo is a very refined abstract expressionist painter. This elephant gets very, very angry if the uh, workers don't give it the brush it wants or the colors it wants. It knows exactly the works it wants to make. And yet, we can't get copyright protected. Um, but it's the museums or the zoo sells its works to collectors because it's a really cool elephant in fairly interesting art. I'm not sure that the bunny and the uh, dolphin up here are necessarily as uh, active artists as the elephant is, but again, they do intentionally make their artwork. Another legal area that we are going to have to deal with 
is who owns the artwork when it's put on a human body. So we have many, many lawsuits. Fortunately, I think the lawsuits between the artists and the individuals who are tattooed have largely gone away because there is something so inappropriate about suing someone for displaying their own body just because it has your artwork on it. But for professional athletes and models who appear in video games and the like, appear in movies and television, the, the uh, tattoo artists are claiming that they own the copyright and work, and their works must be licensed before they're reproduced in other media. So this is another area where the law has not kept up with society. So these are, just looking at the technologies, the vast array of new technologies that are transforming the way art is being created. Um, augmented reality, virtual reality, uh, found materials, of course, we've been looking at for 100 years or more. Uh, music, video games, gaming, imaging, wearable tech, uh, laser cutting are all fascinating areas where the law is, where the technologies are rapidly changing. Law cannot keep up with those, and quite frankly, neither can the curatorial role of museums, art critics, and the media. So artists are creating amazing works of art, but there's no one to collect, assess, critique, contextualize that work. And so in fact, great work is being made, but because people don't understand it, they are not a part of modern culture. And as a result, those works are being lost. Here's just some examples of new media. I am Here is old media. Um, this comes from the Met, but now every piece of work of art in the Met is now on Pinterest, is now on Instagram. So the way we experience old art has been transformed by technology as well. I fell in love with this particular artist. Uh, these are laser cuttings of paper. And so through using multi-layered paper, creating these incredibly integrate, into, uh, intricate, uh, delicate, beautiful pieces of work. Laser light has become a tremendous new art form. Uh, and of course, we see those in rock concerts, but we also see them on a standalone performance art. And each one of these modalities is being integrated by some artists so that one layer of art, one style of art, is used on another. Here we have wearable tech. So you see on the left, the piece of clothing actually moves as a result of people walking up to the artist. Um, and so there are built-in sensors that allow the clothing itself to interact with, with the people around it. There are other artists that are putting in light diodes so the clothing changes light and color and texture as people interact with the individuals. So wearable technology has become yet another new art form. Um, and I'm not going to show you the video here downstairs. This is 3D printing, writ large. An entire car turned into an art project through plastic 3D printing. Uh, this is a video of theirs I don't have time. This is metal 3D printing to create these massive sculptures in metal to, in this case, it was a commentary on housing policy in Great Britain. Uh, here, 3D printing, um, shown at a gut show to critique and create commentary and culture within a, an actual gun show. There was an artist of it to create context and discourse within the gun show, which again, I think is a great juxtaposition for the role of art provided that comment. Virtual reality, augmented reality, so these hands do not exist in the real world. You can only see the hands through your screen or through glasses. If you wear the, the VR lenses, then you walk through this amazing space. Same thing over here. You walk through the art. Uh, this is a form of appropriation art, where, in fact, these were unauthorized artworks thrown upon public squares. And if you have the app, you could see the virtual artwork transforming the community uh, through the artwork. And I'm back to Jeff Coons, um, in this case saying something nice, because this was an Instagram project where he took some of his largest sculptures and virtually placed them around the globe. So if you went on to Instagram or had an app, you would see these works as you walk through public spheres. I love this one. Um, it's not designed as great art. It is, in fact, a children's coloring book. 
the child colors in the pictures on the coloring book, and then when they look through uh, the lenses or through the phone camera, the character pops off the page and becomes interactive. So depending on what color you did it, you would create your own 3D image. Um, and that's sold already as a children's coloring book. Again, the nature of the artwork, the transformation, really is astonishing. Uh, this is uh, uh, the Louvre, um, the EMK uh, uh, area, and this was a both an ephemeral work, because this did not last very long, and an example of how modern technology can create fairly amazing uh, works. So this is the before shot of people walking around uh, the square. The artist laid down paper to create a new image. And what he created was the illusion that the square had been carved out of uh, bedrock. This is all pieces of paper laid down on the square. It lasted about two days before rain and people uh, flushed it off the square. So a great example of an ephemeral performance art piece. Um, finally, I want to talk about the last remaining influencer of art. And this is why, quite frankly, this is one of the reasons that I care so deeply about this particular topic. So we see, again, Jeff Koons, we see Jasper Johns, and we see a very uh, popular piece uh, that was originally owned by Saatchi uh, back in 1991. Uh, that was a piece created by Damien Hirst, The Physical Impossibility of Death in the Mind of Someone Living. Otherwise known as the shark. Uh, and the shark was a shark, um, suspended in a solution much like formaldehyde. And Sachi said, I will buy anything you want to create, just tell me how much it is. Hearst, who is one of the top grit art icons right now, created this work in 91, sold it to Sachi. Uh, and in the middle of here, we have uh, Stevie Cohen. Stevie Cohn is the owner of SAC Capital, a company you may or may not have heard of. Um, Steve Cohn has amassed over a billion dollar art collection. Steve Cohn started as essentially a day trader um, in Brooklyn, and then moved from day trading into hedge funds, and over the course of his career, created one of the largest hedge funds in America, most notorious for also being the most heavily fined financial institution ever in the history of the United States. Many of his employees went to jail for insider trading. The company was fined close to a billion dollars for illegal trading activities, and Steve Cohen himself was never indicted, even though he's the sole controlling partner of that company. He changed his persona in New York by becoming one of, if not the most prominent art collector in, uh, in the city. And with pieces like John, Jasper John, Jeff Kuhn, and Saatchi, he has transformed his billion dollar collection by vastly overpaying for very important pieces of art. And there's a very interesting process that goes on when one does that. Because if the point of a piece of art no longer can be mediated by a critic, the law isn't helpful. The newspaper magazines are no longer in existence. The only thing we have to discuss left is value. Then simply by overpaying for the works, the rich can transform the nature of the discourse of what is important in its cultural artifacts. They can transform the way that the cultural commentary of the artwork is taking place. And so I think it's really important to understand these are also the major donors for museums today. Uh, Cohn himself at one point owned, I believe, two thirds of Sotheby's. Right? When we have two auction houses, he dominated one of those two auction houses. So what's left? Right? So in many ways, we've just simply gone back by 100 years. Right? So in many ways, the foul is true. We have the Medici's, we have the church. This is nothing new. As media has fragmented, as the 20th century has come to an end, we are back, in fact, to the 15th century. We are back to a world of economic city-states, 
dominated by a few super wealthy individuals who control the public discourse. So that's one narrative. Another narrative is where I started. So now we're back to Banksy. So Banksy, who is a very well-known street artist, graffiti artist uh, from England, who uh, was is synonymous, he very carefully controls his actual identity, um, but creates fascinating works around the world. And has gone come to be one of the more interesting cultural commentators as artists in the 21st century. Uh, a movie, a documentary was made about his work um, in 2011. And a few months ago, he created, he took his 2006 work, Girl with the Balloon, uh, which you can see better on the t-shirt uh, than on the artwork. He created Girl with the Balloon, had it auctioned off at some place, and as soon as the hammer went down, the piece was expected to sell for about $800,000, uh, excuse me, about $200,000. Instead, it rose to $1.4 million in value at the auction. Again, the public voted paying for art to set, to set a political story. Um, the minute the auction hammer came down, a shredder built into the six inch deep frame of the artwork began to shred the piece into strips, into individual muslin strips, and then stopped right here. Two guards from Sotheby's very quickly whisked it away, um, and although there are a lot of conspiracy theorists that Sotheby's had something to do with it, you can understand that in the chaos they didn't want to see the damage to the work continue, and in fact they took it away, put it aside, and for a few days there was great consternation. What was this about? Was this a performance art? Was this a stunt? Uh, and in fact, Banks he ultimately released a video, which you can find on YouTube, in which he shows how he made the frame and shows him practicing the shredding of the artwork. Um, and the video ends, there are also some interesting clips of the uh, show. He shows the auction itself, and then it ends with the statement, it always worked in rehearsal. So the attempt that he was making, if you believe the video, and I do, um, was that he was attempting to comment and critique on the obscene prices that people were paying for works at the art galleries, and instead, irony of ironies, the work jammed, the piece is now doubled in value, and it is going on that on international tour. Um, and so I think there is no better metaphor for where the art world is today that makes a shredded image. And I added to that image two different t-shirts that you can find appropriated from Banksy, neither are licensed, uh, both on Etsy. My favorite is the shirt that itself is actually shredded. Uh, but you have the retaped together version for men and you have the shredded shirt for women. So I hope that this is at least the first watch understand how this intermediation in technology is changing the way art is going to be consumed and understood in society uh, in ways that probably people aren't talking about too much yet. And thank you very much for listening. I'm happy to answer any questions.